Good afternoon and welcome to Facebook Live and the uh, with Morrison Planetarium Facebook Live and our uh, open space YouTube channel uh, for today's presentation of Tour of Outer Space. My name is Ryan Wyatt, I'm Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization at the California Academy of Sciences and I'm going to be your host for today's tour. Uh, I'm taking the helm from Josh Roberts, who uh, gave his last tour of outer space last week. Uh, Josh toured innumerable guests through uh, trillions of miles of virtual space to visit different places in our solar system and beyond. Uh, and today I'm gonna kind of take over where he left off. Uh, so if you have any questions at all uh, during the course of the program, please feel free to put those in chat and we'll try to answer those and also uh, potentially visit a few places. Uh, but there are also some places I'd really like to take you to today. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna maybe have a little bit more of an agenda uh, to get us out to a very different perspective on our solar system and the universe around us. Uh, but to start, I'd like to start by looking at the International Space Station. So uh, what we're seeing here is the International Space Station, actually just a few minutes ahead of where it was, uh, where it is currently, uh, because we wanted to, um, uh, we wanted to show it uh, daylit and overland. Uh, this is a great place to start the tour because it's a human scale. People are actually on board the ISS and the whole thing from one side to the other uh, is about the size of a, of a football field. So it's kind of uh, a size that's easy to wrap your head around. And particularly when we talk about the size of the universe, that can be a little challenging sometimes. I should note too that one of the astronauts on board the ISS right now, the International Space Station is Shannon Walker. Shannon and I went to grad school together. Uh, she is out in space. I'm here on Facebook Live and YouTube talking to you. I guess you can decide who got the better gig, but uh, it is a place where people go, the International Space Station, uh, including um, PhD grad students from uh, Rice University. Now, the ISS is kind of as far as humans go out into space these days. Uh, and I think that's what's amazing when we talk about taking a virtual tour of the universe is that, in fact, we can go far beyond where humans have ever gone and far beyond even where our robot explorers have visited in the solar system. So we're actually pulling away from the International Space Station now. It kind of looks like it's plummeting uh, into the Pacific Ocean. That's actually not the case. Uh, we're just pulling away to reveal uh, the a view of the Earth. I can actually put up uh, the, the orbit of the International Space Station to give a little context and to get a sense of actually how high it flies above Earth's surface. It's a few hundred kilometers, a few hundred miles, and it's not terribly far in, uh, in astronomical terms. Uh, when you think about where humans have gone out into space, we're kind of leaving Earth behind in our virtual view uh, of uh, the universe. If you know your constellations, you might recognize uh, Leo the lion here, the backward question mark of uh, Leo and his haunches. If you imagine something that looks a little bit like the Sphinx, uh, you can imagine kind of what Leo the lion might look like. Uh, for a great tour of the night sky, by the way, if you tune into Facebook Live, uh, Morrison Planetarium channel on Thursdays at 1.30 p.m. Pacific, you can get a tour of what's visible in the sky from, uh, from uh, at least from uh, California, but, but really uh, pretty much anywhere. Um, from our assistant director, Bing Kwok. Now, I've, um, I've kind of stopped at our distance here, uh, and I'm not showing some of the uh, representational orbit lines that we often use, but you'll notice if you're paying attention here, I hope it's not too hard to see uh, in whatever Facebook or YouTube interface you're seeing this in, there's this kind of dot that's drifting uh, in this sort of similar way to the Earth. We're seeing a bit of parallax. We're seeing it drift relative to the background stars. That's actually Earth's moon, and this is to scale. So uh, if you put 30 Earths lined up, you'd have about the distance between Earth and the moon. That is as far as humans have traveled into space. So right now we travel a few hundred kilometers, a few hundred miles uh, out into space uh, to, to uh, do work on the International Space Station, like object of jealousy can be um, uh, Shannon Walker. But, uh, but, but the farthest people have ever traveled, humans have ever traveled, is to that distance from Earth to the moon. Uh, and actually, let me go ahead and put uh, our uh, orbit lines up. I think we should see the orbit of the moon here around Earth. Uh, and 
I mentioned that it's about 30 Earth diameters between Earth and the moon. Uh, another way of thinking about that is it's about 240,000 miles, about uh, 400,000 kilometers, or uh, using a distance that uh, is kind of easier to use when talking about astronomical phenomena, it's about a second and a half in terms of light travel time. So it takes a second and a half for, for light to travel from Earth to the moon or vice versa. When you look at a nice full moon out in the sky, you're seeing it as it was a second and a half ago. So when we talk about discoveries beyond the moon, we're really talking about regions that have been explored by our robot spacecraft and using light. So either we sent our kind robot spacecraft out to find, but to visit these different locations in our solar system, or uh, for objects farther away, objects in our solar system, but also objects farther away, uh, we study them using light uh, and figuring out what they're made out of, what's going on in locations very, very far from home. Uh, I think I saw a question asked by one of the, um, uh, in, the in the chat about seeing the rings of Uranus and um, vaguely suspect that could be coming from like an, uh, elementary school student, but let's go ahead and go ahead and see if I can visit uh, Uranus. Um, I actually, we are using, I should note, a uh, piece of software called OpenSpace. I'm retargeting it to take us out to Uranus. I don't remember if we have the rings of Uranus programmed into OpenSpace. Uh, so we're gonna find out as we approach uh, Uranus to see if its ring system is visible. Uh, we're getting close enough to see the orbits of its moons around Uranus. And you'll notice something interesting here that, um, uh, that, the, that the plane of the orbits of the, of the moons is almost face on, not quite, to the sun. So the sun is off here to the right. Uh, and the entire uh, Uranus system is kind of tilted over on its side. Uh, as we get closer, I'm not seeing rings, so sorry to say, uh, those don't seem to be uh, included in the uh, version of open space that we're running, but Uranus does actually have a ring system. Like many of the outer planets, um, really all of the four giant planets in the outer part of our solar system, uh, Uranus does have a ring system. Saturn has the most impressive ring system. Jupiter has probably the wimpiest, but Uranus and Neptune, uh, the two ice giants out at the edge of the solar system also uh, have rings. Uh, unfortunately, just <clears throat> not depicted here in our view of the solar system. Now, what's cool about Uranus, we've actually only visited it um, in, a, in a quick flyby mission. Um, Mars has been visited many, many times. We have, uh, we currently have a rover and in fact, a little helicopter on the surface of Mars uh, that are exploring it. We have numerous spacecraft that have, are in orbit around Mars currently. Um, for some of the more distant worlds, uh, like Jupiter and Saturn, they've both gotten their uh, individual visitors in the form of the uh, Galileo and Juno spacecrafts in the case of uh, Jupiter uh, and the Cassini spacecraft in, in, for uh, Saturn. Uh, but when it comes to Uranus and Neptune, these two outer giant planets, uh, ice worlds, uh, they've only been visited by, uh, I should say ice giants, they've only been visited by the Voyager 2 spacecraft. One little spacecraft, explored them back in uh, in the case of uh, Uranus in 1986, in the case of Neptune, I believe, 1989. Um, actually, I think I screwed that up, but that's what Wikipedia is for, if uh, we can find out the actual dates of that. Uh, but um, uh, if we show the trajectories of those spacecraft, um, you can get a sense of what really are the fastest sort of nuts and bolts objects that we've sent out into the solar system and, and now beyond. So the trajectories that I, I'm showing here, uh, they all start at Earth. That's where all of these uh, were launched from. Uh, one of the easiest to recognize uh, is uh, the, the trajectory of New Horizons. That is the only one of these spacecraft that was launched uh, in the last 20 years. It was launched on a, a very straightforward and direct and high-speed course to visit Pluto. Uh, the former planet, now dwarf planet Pluto, uh, which it uh, visited in, in 2015. Uh, but the other four spacecraft were all sent out in the 1970s. Now, the, uh, and I think I can get this right here. We have the Pioneer 
uh, 10 spacecraft here, a Pioneer 11, uh, and then Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft. These are the five spacecraft, the fastest spacecraft that have ever been built, now zipping outside our solar system. Pioneers 10 and 11, Voyagers 1 and 2, all launched in the 70s, and then New Horizons launched in uh, the early 2000s. Now, I told you how long it takes light to travel from Earth to the moon, just a second and a half. It turns out that the entire solar system, as measured by like the distance across uh, Neptune's orbit here, is about eight light hours in terms of travel time. So it takes about eight hours for light to travel from one side of, of Neptune's orbit to the other. And so as you look at this, you can see that none of the spacecraft have traveled as far as light travels in a single day. So although we've done this amazing job of exploring our solar system, and I've totally glossed over that because I have only talked about the one request we had to see Uranus's rings, and I couldn't even do that because we have Uranus, but no rings in our software. Uh, we have the, uh, this amazing exploration, but it is, um, uh, but it is a limited perspective because we've only had a spacecraft that have been able to go out uh, to this, the distance I've described here. Sorry, I saw another question talking about constellations and how they, uh, how they look from outside the solar system. And that is absolutely great because honestly, I was kind of going to go there anyway. So let me see if I can find our constellations here. Uh, I mentioned the constellation uh, Leo, the lion. And that's a, that's a kind of a cool constellation uh, that you can see in the spring months. I am just checking this here. I don't, I think, I think I'm going to have to do the very dangerous thing of actually opening up uh, the interface here to show you a little bit about how um, the uh, open space interface works. Uh, but let me go ahead and just turn on our constellations. And basically what we can do is show the, um, uh, connect the dots here where now we're seeing our solar system here in the foreground, and we're seeing this connect the dots collection of stars uh, in the background. Uh, just to point out a few that are kind of straightforward here, uh, this is the constellation Aquila, the eagle, with this kind of kite shape in the bright star, star Altair uh, in the constellation. Uh, we have the, the sort of sorry little constellation Delphinus in there. Um, we have the bright star uh, Vega over here and the constellation of Lyra, the harp. And then here we have uh, this kind of cross shape behind uh, the, the trajectories of the spacecraft. Uh, this is Cygnus the Swan. Its tail is kind of pointed up uh, in our view here with its head pointed down and its beautiful swan-like wingspan uh, heading off to, uh, to the right and to the left. So these constellations are kind of like playing connect the dots with stars from here on Earth. And I think what our question asker was asking about is what do these connect the dots look like if we were to pull away from our location here in the solar system? And what we're going to do, and so what we're kind of doing is we're, we've made the sun artificially dim so that we could view the solar system. But now we're making it just as bright as the other stars, and we're depicting them all in the same characteristic way. So the sun appears bright because it's close to us, the way we're illustrating it here in the software. The other stars are fainter because they're farther away. Now, they might be actually intrinsically brighter than the sun. Like here are the stars in the Big Dipper, uh, which is easy to spot from here in the Northern Hemisphere. Some stars are bright in our night sky because they are intrinsically bright, but they might be far away. Some are bright because maybe they're not too intrinsically bright, but they are uh, relatively close to home. So what I've done now is I've, in just a few moments, pulled away many light years from home. So I talked about light taking a second and a half to travel between Earth and the moon, about eight hours to cross our solar system. Now I've traveled tens of light years from home. And those connect the dot pictures that we saw overhead, the constellations that people have talked about for millennia, which have been relatively unchanged from our perspective on Earth uh, for thousands of years, we now see that that connect the dots pattern is actually, we like to call this kind of a pin cushion. It's actually this kind of weird collection of lines that all sort of point to home. You may have noticed that the 
Uh, Big Dipper was uh, connected with, with blue lines. And actually, have, we have two constellations that are shown here in blue. One is the Big Dipper. I kind of lost track of it. I think this is the Big Dipper here. Uh, the other is the constellation Orion. And, and what we can see is that some of the stars in the appear in our constellations, they're bright enough to appear uh, from the Earth, as seen from Earth to appear in our constellations, uh, are relatively close to us, and others are much, much farther away. As we continue to pull back, you can see that this pin cushion uh, is sort of this uh, perspective effect of us looking out into space, drawing two-dimensional pictures by connecting the dots, but in fact, the stars are in three dimensions, some of the bright stars far away are included in those constellations. Some relatively dim stars that are close by are included as well. And so you end up with this pin cushion appearance of uh, the constellation lines almost appearing to uh, point back home uh, to our location, orbiting the sun relatively close to home. Now, these constellations don't actually exist like giant three-dimensional tinker toys out in space. So uh, there's no way that, I mean, if you've been reading, if you've read things like Dark Forest and are worried about aliens finding us, don't worry. There are no giant uh, lines pointing to our location uh, here on Earth. Let me just go ahead and take a moment to turn off these constellations now for a moment. I will say, though, that what we have done is for the last uh, about 80 years or so, we have broadcast our presence using radio waves. So basically, uh, for the starting back in the uh, uh, late 30s, early 1940s, uh, we started creating radio noise in the universe that is distinctly different from any natural source of um, radio wave, radio radiation. Now, radio waves are simply a form of light. Uh, just like uh, visible light or infrared light, which is what we talked about, for example, in our cosmic conversation last week with, uh, with a scientist who creates images for uh, Spitzer Space Telescope. Uh, ultraviolet is another form of light that, uh, can, of course, can give us sunburns. Radio waves are a low-energy form of light that we use for communications or television signals. Uh, if you're not using cable uh, trans or transmitted over radio waves, if you still use an antenna, when you drive your car and uh, are playing your AM, FM radio, those are signals that are carried by uh, radio waves. Turns out that another way of creating radio waves is if you explode atomic bombs in the atmosphere, which we did for a short period of time back in the 50s and 60s. And if you um, have radar, which we of course still use today, uh, those are all sources of radio radiation that is strong enough to escape Earth's ionosphere. Now, you're AM radio station is not going to be something that you can listen to uh, from outer space. Uh, but I've been showing this image now for a while without really explaining it. This sphere is basically centered on the sun, or really on the Earth. It doesn't make much difference at the scale that we are here. Its radius is about uh, that 80 light years. Basically, light that was emitted from Earth about 80 years ago, around the early 40s, um, uh, is, is now reaching kind of this limit out in space. We nickname this the radio sphere. You can imagine it's kind of a bubble of radiation that surrounds us. And if you were an intelligent alien inside the sphere and you had a radio telescope that you could point at Earth, it's possible that you could detect this signal from Earth. And you would know that there's something very strange going on on that planet. Now, you wouldn't be able to watch I Love Lucy or anything like that, but you would be able to detect unusual sort of non-natural radiation coming from Earth. So this is kind of like an electromagnetic bubble centered on Earth about 80 light years in radius. And if you want to think of that in comparison, like those spacecraft that we showed earlier, the trajectories of the Pioneer and Voyager spacecraft and the New Horizons spacecraft, those are the fastest nuts and bolts objects that we've sent out into the universe. But this electromagnetic bubble is the kind of electromagnetic footprint of our species uh, in the galaxy around us. So I mentioned like if you had alien uh, ob astronomers observing uh, Earth, well, let's actually put up then for comparison the locations of some of the extrasolar planets that we've discovered, planets that are in orbit 
around stars other than our sun. Uh, we visited in previous tours of outer space, the planets of our solar system. We visited asteroids, visited all kinds of cool places in our own solar system. But in fact, we now know of thousands of solar systems other than our own, planets orbiting stars other than the sun. These are their locations. Uh, if you look kind of off in the distance here in the upper right, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of them off in this direction uh, because the Kepler spacecraft, which is our most successful planet hunting mission, uh, discovered literally thousands of planets in this direction. However, uh, the ones that are closer by are, have been discovered through various means. And you'll notice that the vast majority of them lie outside our radio sphere. So the many planets that we've discovered in the universe around us, only kind of a handful are really within reach of the radio waves that we've been emitting for the last 80 years or so, the electromagnetic footprint of our species in the planet, uh, our species in the, in the universe. So let's put a little more context. Now, we showed the constellation kind of um, pincushion I was describing. And a lot of the stars in those constellations are, are kind of out of the distance uh, we are now. But every single star that we see is part of our Milky Way galaxy, our collection of hundreds of billions of stars in which we live. I'm going to pull far enough away from our radio sphere now. Uh, and I'm hoping that our galaxy image comes up here. Indeed, it does. And this is a depiction of, uh, of the galaxy in which we reside, our Milky Way galaxy. And we've kept the radio sphere uh, depicted here relative to the size of our galaxy. So again, hundreds of billions of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. When we look at the Milky Way from Earth, we see it as a band of stars that crosses our sky. Uh, it looks so, there's so many stars so faint that they are hazy and kind of blur together. Uh, and they are, uh, looks a little bit like spilt milk. So that's why uh, that part of the sky was called the Milky Way and why the, uh, uh, the Milky Way is called the Milky Way Galaxy. It's called the Milky Way Galaxy. It's a little redundant, actually, because the word galaxy itself comes from uh, the Greek word for milk. Uh, our galaxy, hundreds of billions of stars, is a pretty big player in a relatively uh, not so exciting part of the universe. And so the large and small Magellanic clouds here that have been crossing through our view and have now kind of passing off to the left-hand side of the image, those are satellite galaxies of our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, but again, I want to point out this little kind of collection of pixels here. That's our radio sphere. That's our radio footprint, our electromagnetic footprint in the universe around us. So for 80 years, we've been emitting these waves. And this is as much of the universe as has had access to them. So it's a little daunting when you think about it, how vast the universe is. And we've really only started to scratch the surface here uh, compared to the kind of impact that we've had on the universe around us. Um, since we showed that little pin cushion of stars, well, let me go ahead and bring that back up again because I'm kind of curious exactly how much of a volume those take up. But here you can see, remember that pin cushion, all of those constellation connect the dots images, uh, those cover really just a small fraction of the volume of our Milky Way galaxy. So a uh, humbling perspective on our own Milky Way. Indeed, as Everyday Spacer says, space is big, smiley face. I do like the smiley face because it's kind of great how big space is and that we are able to figure this out. Uh, so let me just go ahead here and um, kind of take us out a little bit farther because I just can't resist the temptation to do this. We're going to leave our Milky Way galaxy behind. Remember the large and small, or sorry, large and small Magellanic clouds, uh, visible, unfortunately, not from the northern hemisphere. You have to go to the uh, southern hemisphere to see those, like Magellan did. Uh, and now we're going to bring up these little points. And every one of these points now does not show the location of a star, but actually an entire galaxy. Some of these are galaxies as big as ours, hundreds of billions or perhaps even a trillion stars inside. Uh, some of them are a bit smaller. But 
what you'll notice here is that the universe is kind of, uh, galaxies are sort of clumped and clustered together. Um, so if someone asked about the local cluster, we're actually what was, what's called a local group. And there are about 50 some odd galaxies that are kind of here in the foreground. Um, it's not, eh, it's not quite, uh, doesn't quite merit the cluster terminology. Uh, the nearest cluster of galaxies is right here. That's the Virgo cluster of galaxies. It has about a thousand galaxies in the Virgo cluster. So in our local group, about 50 galaxies, Vir Virgo cluster, about a thousand. Um, it's a little bit like if this is downtown San Francisco, then we're kind of out in, I don't know, Walnut Creek or something. Uh, for California people, that's an analogy that might make sense, Bay Area folks at least. Um, for others, um, just think of your largest metropolis and uh, a tiny little satellite community to, uh, to get the analogy. Uh, since we don't have a huge amount of time, I actually want to pull back fast enough to show the kind of amazing surveys of galaxies. And, and we're overlaying a whole bunch of surveys here that I won't go into uh, in great detail. But again, every one of these points is an individual galaxy. And what we've been able to do is kind of automate the process of measuring the distances to these amazingly uh, far away objects. And so we've built up a catalog of, uh, of their locations. And we're gonna brighten those. Um, and, uh, and what you'll see is a little deceptive uh, because it kind of looks like the universe is shaped like a butterfly or an hourglass. Uh, that's not the case. It's not that there are no stars, or I'm sorry, no galaxies here or down here. It's just that that's part of the universe we haven't finished mapping yet. Uh, and there are kind of limits on how much we can actually map and things like that. But the main point here is that we have in fact mapped uh, a, a lot of galaxies in our universe. I'm afraid my, my my computer is not keeping up very well here, so I apologize any lags. Uh, but uh, but the punchline here, as we move now far enough away to show this kind of giant fan-shaped structure of locations of galaxies, and in fact, what we call quasars, I won't go into great detail on that. We've also fitted up in the background here this kind of modeled, what really is a baby picture of the universe. And this is what we call the cosmic microwave background. And very simply, the cool parts of the cosmic microwave background, because really this is a temperature map, uh, appear as dark blotches, uh, and hot regions appear as these bright uh, white blobs. Um, yes, I think if, uh, if this were a 17th century atlas, you might see sea monsters depicted in this part of the, uh, the universe, as someone uh, mentioned in the comments. Uh, but, uh, but what's cool about the cosmic microwave background is, well, it's literally quite cool, but uh, it's as the universe has expanded, it's cooled down, we can measure these tiny little fluctuations in temperature. The bright parts, again, are the hot parts, the dark parts are the cool parts, but this is a high contrast image. The difference between the hottest part of this image and the coolest is only about one part in 100,000. These are tiny fluctuations in the temperature of the early universe. And as it turns out, that temperature corresponds to differences in density. So, uh, and I apologize here, I seem to have taxed our open space software to its max, or at least I have taxed our, uh, my little uh, computer in the other room to the max. Um, but the, uh, um, the uh, tiny fluctuations that we see here actually through the action of gravity condensed to form the clusters of galaxies that we saw close to home. And here kind of in this bright center is where we are, this density of points, because we are the ones drawing the map of the universe. We've mapped the region of the universe close to us in much greater detail than the universe farther away. Um, but uh, the deceptive thing here, and the last thought before I head home, is that it looks like we're at the center of the universe and that's not Actually the case. It's just that we're the ones drawing the map, this three-dimensional map in space and time. We're at the center of it in the here and the now, because I mentioned this baby picture of the universe. As we look out into space, we're looking back into time. And so this picture of the universe, these tiny fluctuations in temperature and density, correspond to an epoch when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old, and it's now 13.8 billion years old. So we're seeing the universe as it was a long time ago because light, as I mentioned very early on, takes time to travel from 
outside of, outside of Earth to us, whether it's a second and a half from the moon to Earth, eight hours uh, from the outer parts of our solar system, or uh, the billions of light years and billions of years uh, that we're seeing now this far from home. So it's not that uh, we aren't important, but we're really only at the center of this map because they're, we're the ones drawing it. So with that thought, let me go ahead and start plowing back home. Hopefully the computer will behave well enough to get us all the way home. Uh, and eventually here, we'll fade out all of these points that represent the locations of distant galaxies. Uh, you can see, once again, the Virgo cluster, that downtown San Francisco, to our beautiful but more sedate uh, Walnut Creek that we're heading home to. Uh, we're coming back in our depiction of the Milky Way galaxy and uh, the um, radio sphere should still be illustrated here as this uh, small point in the center of the screen, which is in fact the uh, 80 light year radius sphere centered on Earth. Uh, we're going to actually dive back in past the locations of the extrasolar planets shown here in these small circles. Let me go ahead and take down our exoplanets, move into our radio sphere. So we're now inside that electromagnetic bubble, the footprint uh, in electromagnetic radiation of our, of our species in the universe around us, and then back home toward uh, Earth. So let me go ahead, actually, I think I might actually take us back to Uranus if I'm not careful. So let me go ahead uh, and make sure that we are targeting Earth so that I can get everyone home safely. Uh, but uh, as we do wrap this up, I'm perfectly happy to take more questions. Uh, we had a few to come through in our chat, uh, but we're going to bypass here our trajectories of our spacecraft. And, um, oh, we have a request to see some land masses on Earth. Let me go ahead and see if we can do a little bit of that. Uh, because although we've traveled incredibly far away from home, uh, I think one of the most amazing things about the universe is, in fact, our own home planet Earth. So I apologize here. I'm just taking down some of these uh, some of these lines here. And as we come back home here to Earth, uh, this is the only place in the universe with all of our explorations uh, where we know life exists, where we know for certain, in spite of having found thousands of planets around other stars, uh, this is the one planet we know of with life. I'll just mention that uh, there's also incomplete data up here. Uh, and it's not because there's no clouds on Earth. It's just that we update uh, the, the cloud map uh, on a certain basis, and that part is not yet updated. But let's like fly back in toward Australia. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to visit a land down there, but this is an amazing land mass. Uh, really, in terms of uh, when you visit the surface of Earth, uh, and the, at least in the nice dry land parts of the surface where uh, we have more access. Uh, Australia is one of the oldest uh, continents in terms of uh, the exposed land. Uh, so if you have a chance to visit Australia, you can uh, you can see some of the kind of oldest terrain on the planet. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I'm not the best geologist, uh, but you, the other thing you can see actually, uh, although it's not land masses, is in our depiction of Earth here, we're also showing uh, the bathymetry of the ocean. So these uh, structures that you see, which are actually under the surface of the ocean, these are evidence of our living planet. The, the land masses that we see on Earth are actually carried around its surface because of plate tectonics. Uh, and these kind of remarkable uh, arcs of uh, undersea mountain chains, basically, are evidence of that uh, of that tectonic activity. In fact, as we fly uh, by Japan here, of course, Japan, a relatively tectonically active part of the world, uh, this beautiful view of Earth is really a reminder of how special our planet in the universe is. So with that, I want to thank you all for joining us for this tour of outer space. Uh, looks like we had a few more questions. We'll try to answer those uh, as, we, uh, uh, as we wrap up the program, at least answer questions in chat. Uh, but thanks so much for joining me on my very first chance to give a tour of 
uh, outer space here on uh, Facebook Live and on YouTube. Uh, and we hope you'll join us next week at the same time and uh, maybe visit some different places in the universe around us.